The patrons have spoken, so now we have Golduck. Golduck belongs to the category of Pokemon who are less known than their pre-evolved counterparts. So kind of like Raichu for Pikachu. But in this case, it's the infamously goofy Psyduck. We once thought Misty Psyduck had evolved in the episode Bye Bye Psyduck, but it turned out to be the Pokemon version of Brock. Or to be specific, a Golduck that liked girls a bit too much. Today we'll find out if this duck who isn't even gold was able to find more favor in the competitive scene. So, how good was Gold Duck actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Gold Duck isn't truly part of the red, blue, and yellow metagame, but it did have a small niche thanks to its access to the incredibly powerful Amnesia, which doubled its special stat and allowed it to be potentially quite threatening. Now, it wasn't able to switch into much of anything safely, but it could take advantage of a resting Snorlax with impunity, since after a boost, it threatened pretty much the entire metagame. Executor only required a bit of chip damage to be put in range for a plus two Blizzard. Chip damage that's not difficult to obtain with one's own Executor. Snorlax had a chance to be two hit KO'd by a plus two Surf and got drowned by Hydro Pump. Plus, seeing as resting Snorlax was Golduck's favorite place to switch into, it likely wasn't going to be threatening too much. Tauros got pounded by both water moves and couldn't KO with the Body Slam plus Hyper Beam combo without a crit. Golduck could even use Counter in the last slot to really turn the tables on the bull. Now, it did have issues with Chansey and Starmie, but they could be overcome with multiple Amnesias. The issue would be that they would parallel and damage Golduck as it attempted to grab those multiple amnesias, and if Golduck opted to use Rest in its last slot, then it would beat them one-on-one, -on -one, barring Thunderbolt crits, but it would also be easy prey for Tauros and Snorlax, and thus be worthless afterwards. So it was generally preferable to remove Chansey and Starmie from the game beforehand. This wasn't too difficult a task, given how often those two saw action, and how the Pokemon they switched into, namely Exeggutor, could explode on them. Golduck wasn't the only niche amnesia user around though. Polyrath had better physical bulk, which is important for shrugging off Tauros, and even Hypnosis, which could potentially shut the would-be wall Chansey, Starmie, or Slowbro down. That said, Golduck's advantages were significant too. Its higher special meant it took Thunderbolts better, and more importantly, hit harder, which could be crucial for squeezing out KOs in tight games. Its speed stat was also potentially huge. Polyrath speed tied Cloyster and Victory Bell, whereas Golduck breezed past them, as well as the occasional Dragonite. Finally, not being weak to Psychic was an incredible point in Golduck's favor. So overall, Golduck was only seen once in a blue moon, but it did have an actual niche in RBYOU. In UU, however, it was quite decent, even though it had a lot of water type competition, mainly the excellent Tentacruel and Vaporeon, but it was generally a threat. When Gen 2 came around, the special stat was split into two. Amnesia was relegated to boosting only special defense, and Golduck took a massive hit from that. Golduck did get Cross Chop, which was a powerful move not many other Pokemon had, but it wasn't nearly powerful enough to threaten OU teams. It got blanked by Zapdos and Raikou, and even the super effective Cross Chop wasn't even a guaranteed three hit KO on Snorlax with spikes up. Golduck's newfound access to Hypnosis wasn't getting it anywhere either, since this was the generation of Rest and sleep talk. Plus, GSC already had an excellent offensive water type, the incredibly dangerous Growth Vaporeon, who Golduck just could not hope to keep up with. Even Yu passed the duck by too, as there were plenty of excellent water types like the Slow Twins, Quillfish, Quagsire, Gyarados, Blastoise, and Kabutops, who all had far more to offer in terms of offense and defense. So Golduck wasn't going to be seen much at all, even in NU, because its water typing and stats were far too much for the NU tier. It easily overwhelmed the fire and not fully evolved late in metagame, leading it to its ban. So unfortunately, Gen 2 Golduck just wasn't going to see competitive use, which is a shame. Also fun trivia fact, Golduck received pedal dance from the New York Pokemon Center event, and you are now imagining Golduck leading a dance crew of Blossom through a colorful garden, which should make up for the disappointment of its competitive use. Golduck was able to make a return to its offensive boosting ways upon receiving Calm Mind. It was sadly not going to be able to pull it off in OU, as there resided another water type named Suicune, which also had the move, and its defensive stats were far more impressive, which went a lot further than Golduck's advantages. Those advantages including slightly higher special attack stat, Cloud9 ignoring the leftovers canceling effect of the ever-present Tyranitar Sandstream, and access to Cross Chop to seriously threaten Blissey, Snorlax, and Regice. These were great traits for 
for sure, but they just didn't have as much weight to them as Suicune's shocking bulk, which allowed Suicune to shrug off Pokemon that Golduck would get smacked hard by, such as Salamence and Aerodactyl. There were perhaps some use for it for trainers interested in pushing boundaries, but as it were, it didn't see any real OU usage. However, it didn't mind too much because it was an excellent Pokemon in UU due to how well-rounded it was despite not being particularly overwhelming in any of its stats. It wasn't blazing, but it was fast. It wasn't a tank, but it was bulky. And it wasn't exactly Dwayne Johnson, but it was strong. It was a unique threat with its offensive combine set. It outsped much of the metagame, two-hit KO'd many Pokemon after a boost, and could take a hit, most importantly from the fast choice banders like Scyther and Jolly Kangaskhan. Hypnosis made it even more of a threat, as it could simply shut an attempted counter down and continue to boost. And even if it wasn't going to be able to sweep, its ability to sleep something could be taken advantage of by its teammates. As an excellent aside, though it wasn't too much of a defensive Pokemon, Cloud9 also gave it unique defensive utility. It allowed it to thwart the terrifying Rain Dance Swift Swim Amistar, which famously cleaved through most offense. Fending off Sunny Day Chlorophyll Vileplume was incredibly valuable as well. Overall, Golduck's multiple distinctive qualities came together to form a unique quality Pokemon in Gen 3 UU. Generation 4's OU was far beyond Golduck's capability, and its UU was significantly power crept. Milotic now stood among the tier's ranks. It was mostly known for its defense, but it could run offensive sets that pretty much entirely outclassed Golduck's old calm mindset. Thanks to higher immediate special attack, making up for its lack of boosting, as well as greater bulk, giving it defensive utility against Pokemon like Moltres, while recover meant Milotic could be relied on throughout the game. Since Registeel and Chansey were so common, it was important that it could offer some something else other than just offense, as it was realistically going to have games where it was walled, and Milotic did that better than Golduck. While Golduck could theoretically use Cross Chop against those two, one was probably better off running a physical water type with a fighting move. Azumarill, Feraligator, and Kabutops could all use superpower and be more effective overall. Milotic had Hypnosis just like Golduck too, so it really didn't have anything to stand out as an offensive threat. Now Golduck did have one small niche Milotic couldn't replicate, Cloud9, which was of interest since Rain Dance teams absolutely dominated Yuyu to the point of potentially being broken. Golduck could check Amistar, Kabutops, and Gorbis well, and was decent against Quillfish. It could even check Ludicolo by switching in on a non-grass move and using Encore, thus neutering it and making it easy to play around. The problem was that Golduck was almost complete dead weight against non-Rain teams, and most players preferred more consistently useful Pokemon. Thus, Golduck dropped to NU. Cloud9 was interesting there given the power of sunny day teams that abused the dangerous chlorophyll shift tree and victory bell, so a check to them was always appreciated. However, it was the same problem as in Yu Golduck wasn't too valuable apart from that specific matchup, as it was overwhelmed by offensive teams with Charizard, Jinx, and Tauros, and walled by incredibly common Slow King. So Golduck was a hit or miss Pokemon that missed more often than it hit, and as such didn't see much usage. Golduck just had a frustratingly inconsistent fourth generation overall. Gen 5 was all about weather, so surely Golduck and its Cloud9 had some sort of niche, right? Uh... Well, a few players certainly tried, but it was quickly proven that Golduck had no place in a metagame. Filled to the brim with threats such as Latios, Terrakion, Keldeo, Garchomp, Thunderous, Excadrill, and more. The generation's power creep also meant that Yuyu was now far beyond Golduck's reach, as was the new Ryu. And as such, Golduck found itself in NU once more. Though this time it was a lower placement than the previous generation. Making matters worse was the fact that Sun Teams, while still existing, were not half as common as they were the previous previous generation. And worse still, NU had itself a premier offensive water type, the diverse and immensely threatening Samurai. Golduck did have one small niche over it though. With Substitute and Calm Mind, it turned Alomomola from Unwavering Wall into Setup Fodder. From there, Golduck was quite difficult to deal with. In all honesty, it probably should have seen more usage than it did. Destroying Alomomola was a seriously desirable trait for an offensive Pokemon, and it threatened much of the tier once it's set up with just Surf and Ice Beam. Perhaps it would have if Generation 5 had gone a little longer. But as it were, most players preferred the immediacy of Samurott, who was far better against non-Alomomola teams. Though it was overlooked, at least Golduck had a niche as opposed to the plethora of its fellow Gen 1 Pokemon that had completely fallen out of viability by now. 
It was the same story everyone had gotten used to upon Generation 6 release. Power creep, most Pokemon that weren't OU staples got knocked down a peg the whole nine yards. Golduck hadn't received any buffs besides clear smog, a move it was definitely not fit to use and itself fit into the category of most Pokemon. So it should come as no surprise that OU, UU, and RU flew right by it. This time around, even NU had grown too powerful to be hospitable for the duck, who found itself in the new lowest tier, PU. There, however, it was quite a good swift swim sweeper. After a single turn of setup, its already strong life orb hydro pumps picked up one hit KO potential on many neutral targets, and there was no outspeeding it with the choice scarfer, like not even the speedy Raichu, without even requiring a plus speed nature to boot. It was tough to wall too, with Ice Beam KOing Tangela after Stealth Rock. Being especially defensive grass type wasn't enough either. Golduck preyed on Roselia's weak defense stat with a vicious super effective Psy Shock. Golduck wasn't a perfect Pokemon, as with Life Orb Recoil, it often found its sweep cut short since it rarely had perfect setup opportunities and taking damage as it used Rain Dance meant the damage it would dish out would be limited. It also struggled against specially bulky Pokemon like Regice and Audino. However, these flaws were nothing that could not be overcome with smart play and team building. For example, Nasty Plot Ninetales made for an excellent partner. Overall, Gen 6 Golduck was a fine PU Pokemon that threatened many a team with decent consistency. Once more, the influx of new Pokemon meant bad news for Pokemon that were previously unspectacular, as they and their competition tumbled through the tiering rung. For Golduck, this was especially poignant as it now faced competition in its role as a PU Swift Swim Sweeper, with not one, not two, but three Pokemon, Amastar, Ludicolo, and Floatzel. All three Pokemon were noticeably more powerful than Golduck. The former two had the benefits of extra resistances via their secondary typings. Ludicolo had a terrific secondary stab attack, Amastar also had the option of the ludicrously fearsome Shell Smash, and Floatso was an excellent immediate Pokemon, not needing rain or any sort of setup to pose a threat and dish out damage. Golduck was just entirely inferior to all of them, and while it wasn't a bad Pokemon per se, if you were trying to win, you would just be shooting yourself in the foot by using it over the competition, as it would objectively perform worse just about every single time. As it had no legitimate niche, it didn't get used at all, and eventually wasn't even worthy of being called PU. It fell into the limbo of untiered, the place where fully evolved Pokemon not recommended for use in any singles tier go. Golduck needs gold buffs. While Golduck's Cloud 9 could nominally be used for weather control, it wasn't strong enough on its own to be used for such a niche purpose in VGC. Instead, Golduck rose to prominence by abusing the weather, but while it first gained access to Swift Swim in Gen 5, it was only in the warmer waters of Alola and the 2017 limited format that Golduck was able to put it to use. The usual suspects for Swift Swim abuse, Ludicolo especially, were absent, giving Golduck a moment to prove its mettle. While Golduck's attacking power still left left something to be desired, the advent of Z-moves gave it just enough oomph to make for a strong rain sweeper, especially when paired with its avian friend Pelipper. The basic strategy was to lead Pelipper and Golduck, put something in the extreme spin cycle with Golduck's Z Hydro Pump, and then set Tailwind with Pelipper, giving your team a nominal one Pokemon advantage, speed control, and favorable weather if all went well. In a format lacking in strong speed control, this was immensely valuable. Other than Hydro Pump, Golduck would come with Scald and and Ice Beam for reliable damage and coverage. It's at this point that I have to make an aside. This team became extremely popular very early in VGC 2017 due to its ease of use, and as is the case with many popular teams, it earned its own nickname of Double Ducks, or just Ducks. But here's the thing, Pelipper isn't a freaking duck, it's a pelican. It's in its name, its whole thing is fitting stuff in its giant bill, so I don't know whoever came up with Ducks, and it's definitely catchy, but you should come visit California and see what a pelican actually is. Anyways, what Ducks could and should have referred to was the combination of Golduck and Porygon 2, a common sight of these sorts of builds. Along with its Duck teammate and its fake Duck teammate, Golduck was also frequently paired with Tapu Koko to take advantage of rain, Alolan Muk to handle opposing Tapus, and Tapu Bulu who was on Gastrodon removal duty. As we said earlier, the simplicity of the... <sighs> Ducks meant that it put up quite a few strong performances early in the format, most especially at the hands of Tommy Kulin, who took 7th place at 3 different internationals in a row, EU, Latin America, and Melbourne. So 3 7s in a row, that's pretty good luck, eh? But it wasn't just luck on Tommy's side. In addition to popularizing and piloting the core of Coco, Muk, Porygon2, and Tapu Bulu, Tommy optimized Ducks to beat its counters once people started catching wind of what was going on. While Porygon2 might be Golduck's actual duck partner, it was also one of its 
worst enemies. After Tommy's performance in the EU and Latin America, players started running very bulky Porygon 2, designed to live a Z Hydro Pump from Golduck, and a move from Pelipper before setting up Trick Room and undoing all the duck's hard work. In retaliation, Tommy swapped Pelipper's Scald out for Brine, letting him polish off the opposing duck. I know that's not actually a Golduck tech, but it was so important to Golduck's success that I had to mention it. Tommy also made a smart meta call going into Melbourne and swapped Tapu Bulu for Buzzwole, a switch made to catch the rise in Gigalith and Cartana. Nevertheless, time went by, players figured out that Gastrodon and Gudra shut down the team almost entirely, and the ducks dropped off a bit before surging back to prominence in the early summer with a flock of good placings. And I apologize if I butcher any of your names. Dicky Wihaya placed fourth at the Kuala Lumpur Regionals. David Mancuso took seventh in Toronto. Paul Ruiz nabbed seventh in Santiago. And Jason Ao Ying Ho Fai made top three at the Hong Kong Regionals. Sean Bannon's fourth place at the North American International Championships instilled a little bit more hope in the archetype, leading to Gold Duck's only gold medal in 2017. Thomas Platter's first place finish at the Liverpool Regionals, where he used an interesting combo of Metagross and Garchomp alongside other common members of the Ducks support squad. However, the Ducks weren't able to make the top billing at Worlds, at least not both of them. In a big twist, Argentinian Sebastian Escalante abandoned Pelipper for the less common Politoed and brought in Klefki in place of Porygon 2, achieving an incredible sixth place with his new spin on the Rain archetype. His countryman Federico Tirano used a very similar build, only swapping Klefki for Trevnit to place 18th. And Tommy? He stuck with Old Reliable using the same team from Melbourne, but instead of 7th, he took 79th. Also of note is Mitchell Davies' repeat performance with the Ducks at the Anaheim Open, the open tournament that happened almost simultaneously with Worlds as players were eliminated. Mitchell took 14th with a new spin that featured Tapu Lele and Cartana. And that wasn't his only chance to revisit his feathered friends, because 2017 was an especially long season, as certain events actually happened twice within the same season. As a result, Mitchell was able to return to San Jose Regionals, where he'd placed third with the Ducks almost a full year before, and put his new team to work, taking seventh place. After Worlds, however, Politoed was gone once again, and the status quack settled back in. The Ducks actually had quite a respectable post-Worlds performance. Riley Factura took sixth in Vancouver, and Lorenzo Semeraro played spiritual successor to Tommy Colleen by one-upping his seventh place at the EU Internationals with a sixth place of his own. Meanwhile, in Brisbane, Malcolm McKellar secured seventh place, while Chris Gyalgozglu took fifth. But arguably the Ducks' biggest performance came at another repeat event in Kuala Lumpur, where it had its highest top eight saturation yet. Brian Lee took eighth, Chan Ji Yun took fifth, and Dicky Wihaya proved Mitchell and Tommy weren't the only Duck experts by following up his fourth place in the early Kuala Lumpur regionals with a third at this special event. Golduck's most curious performance of the entire year, however, came with its last notable placing, Giovanni Panarello's fourth at the Torino special event. Giovanni didn't use Golduck with Pelipper, and he also didn't use it with Politoed. In fact, he didn't bring any rain at all. Whether it was still Swift Swim or possibly Cloud9 is a mystery, but either way, it was a fitting send-off for Golduck's one year of notoriety. And that's it! So how good was Golduck actually? Well, it's a water type with well-rounded stats and a lot of unique traits, including an interesting move pull and the Cloud9 ability, which has led to various stints in lower tiers over the years. Unfortunately, it has never been truly excellent, and with the lack of buffs given to it over the years, it's only natural it would fall to a worse and worse place with each passing generation. Luckily, it had a year of top tier viability in VGC, so at least there's that. Perhaps when it's released in Generation 8, maybe it'll get some of that delightful Kanto pandering, and it will become viable. But Game Freak will probably give it to Psyduck instead, so we can live in hope. Thanks for watching, everyone, and a great special thanks to the patrons for voting for this Pokemon and for continued support of our videos. And as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know what do you think about competitive Golduck? What kind of buffs would you give it so that people will actually use it besides just for Cloud9? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. Also, follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.